I would like to begin my presentation with the acknowledgement that we're on the unceded territories of the, of the Coast Salish people. And so uh, to continue my presentation, it's really, I think, talking about transit in metropolitan Vancouver is really one of personal experiences as well as, I think, a discussion of of really my own professional interests that uh, really I hope today to kind of give you an overview of what's happening in terms of uh, transportation as well as economics and urban development in metropolitan Vancouver. I show you this picture because this is one of a personal experience of transit, that this is an example of I, the fact that I am a product of the transportation system of metropolitan Vancouver that is affordable, accessible, and dependable most of the time, that uh, this bus allowed my father to have a commute that was 15, that was 15 to 20 minutes and was highly dependable throughout his career and I think as such provided a foundation for a lot of working class and immigrant families in the city. But then of course going into a professional, a professional understanding, I got to go to UCLA and begin to understand really the complexities and challenges in t of what's happening in, of transit, of providing transit, uh, and, and really what's going on in terms of really the roles of land use and transportation through which I hope to present it to you today, and really actually how buses can actually be part of action movies. Uh, the number 10 Santa Monica was that bus that was on speed, in speed, of course, but that uh, really it goes into the ability to perhaps speak a little bit American today. So going into talking about the region, I think it's thinking about Vancouver as in this photo, really a, a, a region that is constrained, that it is constrained on three sides, the ocean on one side, the mountains on the other, and with the with the U.S. U.S. bound a border as a as a as a as really a region that it, that has that element of constraint that it's it's fixing in towards understanding how this fits in. And when we talk about metropolitan Vancouver, we're talking about the 25th largest uh, re metropolitan region in in Canada and the United States. It's just between Charlottesville and. Uh, and Orlando, but then at the same time, within this size, we actually see this constraint that 50, that 50 percent of the population of British Columbia and over 50 percent of the gross domestic product of of the province is actually on 0.2 percent of the land, and it kind of again presents this element of r really the kind of ingredients of what's happening in the region. And I think in talking about the region, of course, if there is a single planning concept that I hope that you walk away in this discussion of uh, metropolitan Vancouver, it really is on this one fundamental basis, and it is cities in a sea of green, that the agricultural land reserve in 1973, which effectively set up a green belt in the, which hemmed in urban development in the region, that, that this is a foundation that was founded upon, uh, we were a, upon what this metropolitan area has become. And within this metropolitan area, it's also the acknowledgement of, if you will, the role of nature and very much how one single flood in 1948 uh, really catalyzed that discussion of re really where development should occur and how it should occur that this single flood in 1948 actually took out 10 percent of the of the GDP for British Columbia of that particular year so there is this element of how nature defines this region again but then of course it's how building the cities in a sea of green it has been a multi-generational project that very much I, I it is a project through which I was lucky enough to actually be born into to kind of begin this understanding that your process in building cities at sustainable as ones are ones that are multi-generational as it progresses over time as well as the cooperation of any number of governments that these are these types of collaborations that has produced the city today 
But then I think it's going in and talking about how that development has occurred and really how things looked like in 1986 with a region of 1.2 million and how that evolves to a, a region of 2.4 million, but yet, but yet is particularly concentrated in, 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 in areas that are serviced by transit and how much sa transit has been that organizing principle along with this green belt, this, uh, the agricultural land reserve that has created the city and region that we enjoy today and that very much the workers that we see in, in, in the city of Vancouver actually largely live and work in the city but then at the same time it's really how metropolitan Vancouver is actually a constellation of cities as opposed to just a hub in a central spoke of suburbs and within that success you actually find that metropolitan Vancouver is actually in, um, doing quite, quite well in terms of those who take transit that uh, in terms of of West Coast cities, Vancouver at 20% is actually um, the highest in terms of most share when we think about transit in, 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 in on the West Coast and most, and most parts of North America, with, the, with of course the exception of the northeast corner of, of, the, of, of, of the continent. But I think in talking about transit in, in, in the metropolitan Vancouver, it's the fact that it's not particularly concentrated in, speci in a specific service type that, yes, indeed, 20% of the workforce uh, do take transit to work, but within those specific industries, we actually find that, well, a third of the hospitality industry take transit to work, but then at the same time, in, in other sectors like the technology, like, te like high tech, about uh, over one in four workers actually take transit. So you actually see part of the success of understanding Metropolitan Vancouver is the diversity of the region in terms of those who take transit to work, that it's not just segmented within a single sector, but then it's it's really spread out in that sector. And when we talk about development, of course, it's actually, I th think, how new development's been concentrated in the region. We see that one in five new housing units over the last 10 years has actually been in one of these red dots. And these red dots represent that 400 meter or 1300 foot type of distance away from a SkyTrain station. And I think that that really uh, speaks towards the role of planning and transit and land use that has occurred here. But of course, mixed into this conversation, it's the ongoing challenges of transit-oriented displacement and indeed transit-oriented gentrification that over this period in one of the centers, as an example, um, and that we, we see actually the loss of, of affordable, uh, s livable housing that we see um, really this, I think, bigger complexity in terms of what is being built as opposed to who's it being built for. And this really hides lights. Really one of the biggest challenges is really one of income that you find that when it comes to uh, the cost of housing, Vancouver is about the third most expensive housing market in, uh, in North America, just after San Francisco and Silicon Valley. But then when we t take a look at really incomes, we actually find that Vancouver is number 50 that this, I think, gives you a sense of really our ongoing economic development challenges that we have, we may have housing costs around a San Francisco or Silicon Valley, but we have incomes that's typically around a, well, a Charlottesville or a Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it didn't know that there was a Lancaster, Pennsylvania. But I think this gives you a construct of one of the biggest challenges going on in our, in our region in terms of economics and how it relates towards that disconnection of, 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 of incomes to housing. But then it's also how incomes have remained relatively flat. And really, it's also how it's particularly um, the ongoing challenges in very specific demographics. This is, a, this is a chart of really those of working age in metropolitan Vancouver compared to ten, Canada's 10 largest metropolitan areas and really how well in one way it begins to understand the role of our economy um, in terms of really which cities and metropolitan areas uh, really have high incomes in terms of Calgary, um, Ottawa for government and, and, uh, and Toronto for or in terms of its role of being a global city. But then we also see that Vancouver actually ends up to be number nine 
in terms of uh, incomes for uh, people with, for uh, working age people with bachelor degrees. And I think that that really, I think, produces a sizable ongoing challenge for the kinds of uh, things we want to do in housing. But going in towards housing, it's really how much housing has, housing prices have increased, whether it be for single family homes, townhouses, or condominiums, and how much that has changed in a very, 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 fairly quick amount of time. Um, this is a map of single family homes in the million dollar map line for 2006 in the city of Vancouver, and really how that's changed by 2017. Every single family home's over a million dollars. And I think that when we look at the region, it's also how much that's changed in, in, four, in four years that uh, really if this is the scene in 2014 regionally when we talk about million dollar homes that 23 percent were over a million dollars and now it's 73 percent. And I think that this presents really the fundamental uh, challenge, again, in terms of housing that certainly doesn't look like single family homes are going to be the method towards dealing with housing. And I think that that brings in towards these larger conversations that need to occur in terms of densification and development and where it occurs. And part of that is shaped with the fact that when it comes to household expenditures, uh, transportation is the second largest in British Columbia. Columbia for households, and that really brings in to another element that's not only about, again, the idea of housing, but then the role of transportation and transportation costs. Um, a lot of this research has been led by Metro Vancouver for this region, and I think this is a, uh, this is a fantastic report um, that was uh, published a few years ago that um, I, I think really highlight those costs, that when you actually think about um, the cost of transportation over 25 years, and really add that towards come um, add that towards um, that idea of housing values. You actually see really the role and actually how much that changes the understanding of affordable housing, so that you focus on this map. Um, this is a study that was a little bit um, later, uh, a little bit uh, dated, but then in this map, when you look at just housing values, only 43% of single family homes were over a million dollars in 2016, but then when you add in a transportation mortgage, if you will, it goes up to 92. So you can see really how that role of transportation really begins, to, ought to hopefully shape one's understanding of affordable housing as it's really understanding not only about daily transportation costs, but the another way of thinking about transportation is really, if you will, a transportation mortgage. And within that, a, um, a, a way of shaping what is true affordability in any city region. But I think the consequence of this is really seen on the streets. And I think that this is really, I think, um, symptomatic of really some of the ongoing challenges for the city. Uh, we have really this sizable growth in terms of homelessness from 1986 to 2018. Um, and then, but then this comes out of face of growth of the fact that we have continued to build over the last, um, well, over the last uh, few decades in the city of Vancouver, this data that's focused on the city of Vancouver. But then at the same time, it goes into the question of not only what we build, but for who. Uh, we focus on particularly this discussion of growth and development as this is about buildings that were approved within the last uh, two years for, build, uh, for, for construction and as this is based upon uh, really the income brackets and really what's going on is that about 66% of what we build are for those who are earning over $100,000 a year. But I think this gives you really, again, the challenges of developing in the, in, in the city of Vancouver as an example. But then fixed in towards actually who, how does income be, uh, be distributed in the region, that um, it is that kind of mismatch that provides that challenge in terms of what we build for who. 
and I think that it's also for who it's really the kind of fundamental economics of the of of this type of development as we find out that about 40 percent of the condominium of the condominiums built in Vancouver are investor owned and I think that that goes into really how you can develop in the city of Vancouver and what drives development and really another element is the is the is the consequences of this which is the suburbanization of low of the of low income communities from this scene in 1980 largely concentrated in the inner city of Vancouver to really the suburbanization of that population into the suburbs and how much of that is also connected towards the role of immigration and how Vancouver is a region of immigrants and it's actually the second highest, second to Toronto in terms of its immigrant population and how, how, are they, how is that population connected to, um, to work. And as it is indeed, I believe there is an American saying, immigrants get the job done but then it's in that construct of how do they get to work. And when we talk about immigrants, it's of course a relationship to, uh, to, to Asia, to the Asia Pacific, and how much Vancouver is actually connected towards, uh, it's, it's a series of Asian diasporas in terms of population and money. But I think that this goes in towards this other conversation of how it connects up to other populations, in particular refugees, and how well our transit systems connected to the refugee population in the region of how how they does that population have a transportation and mobility network that that is both that balance out coverage with frequency and affordability and really the discussion of visible minority populations of communities of color that this is effectively a region of a majority minority population and again uh, does does do those communities have access to transit and mixed into a discussion of really our relationships to our indigenous peoples and where in where that population lives and how does how does that community get a t get connected by tra by transportation but of course there is a larger question that and it is climate change that for metropolitan vancouver we're we're looking at summers by 2050 in, like seattle which seems rather pleasant then to ultimately summers like san diego by 2080 that, which also seems rather pleasant. My, <laughs> my only question when I give this slide is, well, what are the summers in San Diego going to be like by 2080? And really it's one that's not only hot, but then one that's dry in terms of water, in terms of where, um, how our snowpack and uh, our water reservoirs are going to work. And then not only one of perhaps too little water, but one of too much water and how sea level rise will be shaping our region. And really, I think it's moving forward that goes in towards perhaps muddling through. That um, I, it's not only going to be about policies within the city of Vancouver, but I think that the, some of the most interesting housing policies, in, which are inherently I think now are now bringing in a conversation about um, about transportation, actually can be found in the. Um, in the cities outside of the central city of Vancouver, that it's in municipalities like Burnaby, New Westminster, and the city of North Vancouver that I think draw upon a certain understanding of the region that aren't necessarily expressed in the um, in, in in just in just one central city and. Just a quick plug of the sequel to that first study of housing and transportation that uh, Ray Khan, who I don't know is in the audience, is going to be holding a bit of a, uh, a, a workshop in terms of their work in connecting transit or in, and I think pursuing a much, I think, sizable task in terms of transit oriented um, affordable housing. And really, I think it's really in this stage a connection between some, uh, what's going Going on in terms of not only planning, in this case, uh, to, to a slide that represents um, the trans new transportation plan that is going to be pursued for 2050, but then also the new metropolitan air um, uh, metropolitan planning uh, that's going to occur to 2050. But really moving in towards not only the plan, but then the types of 
government, uh, multi-level co governmental cooperation and mission alignment between the different agencies, understanding that affordability just can't be accomplished by just housing alone. And I think fundamentally it goes in towards really under, uh, providing a, uh, an opportunity to, under, to connect up to the cultural capital transportation of, of transit, that I think the success of TransLink, I think in recent years has actually been not only one of technical expertise and excellence but one of culture that really we see, if you will, the development of, I think, a keen cultural capital of, trans of transit in Vancouver when it comes to, I think, a popularization of transit. Hope Maybe this is perhaps a new expansion of transit services. But then also user interface, whereby, um, tr whereby the thought of the user and how centered, uh, I think, the rethinking of the user experience, I think, has greatly enhanced um, the the, the role of transit in the lives of people in metropolitan Vancouver and really in times of shortage, again, if you will, the discussion of shortage and constraint, the opportunity for innovation that um, really we go into this discussion about sparking joy and a certain level of, of authenticity, but then the, the really the growth of whimsy and status that TransLink has been able to develop in, in a relatively short amount of time that has been an incredible yeoman's work. And so finally, I'll end it here.